right, welcome to another Coach's Corner where we answer all your questions about anything triathlon related. You can leave your questions in the comment section below this video. Use the hashtag GTN Coach's Corner or below any of our videos. Uh, we'll pick them up and answer them in a future episode. So let's get to the questions, Mark. Yeah. Starting with this one from KGKD. How to calculate lactate threshold on the track and then define goals. I assume by track they mean running on this one. Yeah, rather than actually running around an athletics track. Now, obviously with uh, lactate threshold, the most accurate way of calculating this is to head on into a sports science lab. Um, obviously, you're gonna get very good results from that, but not as easy accessible for everyone. So, um, to get your threshold run pace, you can do this out and about on the road. We'd normally suggest on a relatively flattish trail or road. Um, and then your threshold, which you're trying to gain, is roughly speaking, the best average pace that you can maintain for 60 minutes. Yeah, but obviously testing how fast you can run for 60 minutes at a maximum effort, is really hard because you could run for maximum effort for 60 minutes uh, and no one really wants to do that unless they really have to in a race situation so what you can do is you can estimate that and the best way to do that especially if you're going solo is to go for a 30 minute as uh, hard as you can uh, understand that you're not going to be pushing as hard as you might in a race situation uh, so that's where you're going to be a little bit lower than your normal uh, effort so you're only going to take the last 20 minutes of that uh, and measure the last 20 minutes of your, your heart rate and your pace for that. Uh, and that's going to be essentially the pace you could maintain for a full 60 minutes were you in the ideal scenario, were you in a race situation with uh, people pushing you as hard as you can and crowds cheering on the side, etc., etc. So that's the best way to estimate your threshold paces. Yeah, it's, it's a real world test. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. And I've used that a lot over the years and it gets you in a very, very good ballpark. Uh, just in case you're wondering, why am I doing 30 minutes and completely ignoring the first 10 minutes? Mostly just because it takes you a little time just to settle into the pace and to get that heart rate up. So you don't want that affecting the average that you're taking. Yeah, exactly. And then you can use that to prescribe the rest of your training. So you do a session that's at 80% of that or 60% of that. So you know how hard you're working relative to your maximum. Brilliant. Uh, next question is quite a long one, actually, swim related from Hurricane. Um, Thanks for another great video. I'm just getting into triathlon, welcome, and I'm not sure how to approach swim training. I did a lot of swimming at school, orientated towards purely swimming competitions. Um, I always preferred longer intervals and distance training, um, but training was always about all four strokes and intervals not usually much longer than 200 meters. We also did lots of pool specific technique work. I know you have some swimming content which will help and I'll check that out. Um, but is there anything important to consider going from pool to open water and even ocean swims? Um, now, to be clear, this is something a lot of people will struggle with and actually even swimmers. So myself, coming from a swimming background as well, I expected to jump into triathlon and be leading out the swims. And it just wasn't the case initially because I mean, I quite often liken open water swimming to a completely new sport to swimming in the pool because there are so many things that you need to adapt to and get used to. Yeah, it's a bit like mountain biking versus road biking. They're like completely different sports. They require similar strengths, but a lot of different skills. And the best way to practice this is actually to practice this. Uh, you can do some things in the pool where you get ready for the open water, such as swimming really close to other people, uh, sighting, those kind of things, even putting your wetsuit on, if your pool will allow you to wear your wetsuit in the pool. Uh, that will help you get more comfortable when you do go out into the open water, but it is something that you are literally just gonna have to go and practice. Yeah, now a couple of things that I would suggest um, is first off, as you kind of suggest yourself, start doing some longer reps just to get used to just kind of that sustained um, swimming uh, without stopping. But also one of the biggest things with open water and triathlon swimming is the surges in pace and change of pace. Now, normally when you're in the pool, you just settle into a nice even pace and try and swim as best pace, best speed you can. In triathlon, you're surging to get onto people's feet, to get round, to get to a buoy, uh, waves hitting you, and you need to practice that in training. So you start throwing a couple of like intervals in the middle of reps, whether that's like 10 strokes really hard every 100 meters, or you do 25 meters hard into a threshold effort, 25 meters hard threshold. No you can be wall, really no creative. No wall turns is a good way because you've yes. got to get going again. If you turn without touching the wall and you've got to get your pace going again, that's definitely something that you're definitely going to use in the open water when you swim part round a boy or round another person. Uh, so yeah, practice those skills. It'll definitely help you make that transition to open water swimming. Yeah, brilliant. Next 
question from Irina Ray. Um, hey guys, does triathlon training always need to be based around events? I'm currently looking for a coach and it feels overwhelming to think about events when I'm just starting out and with not only triathlon, but let's be honest, with, all, uh, with sport at all. I have a swimming coach with whom I'm building my swimming foundation, but I want to have a consistent training plan in all disciplines. Can you share what type of coaching exists? Well, uh, all types of coaching yeah. exist, don't they? Anything you want. And yeah, you absolutely don't have to train for an event. In fact, there's quite a few people out there who aren't training for an event and still join triathlon clubs and triathlon groups uh, just for the social aspect of it and keeping fit without actually ever setting a goal. And to be honest, because they swim, bike, run and just enjoy it, they don't necessarily do competitions. I still consider them triathletes. Absolutely, of course they are still triathletes. There actually might be a triathlete coach's dream because there's no time pressure, there's no pressure of goals. You can just slowly tick away at those skills and improve your fitness and improve your form uh, as you as you go at your own pace without any kind of like real real time pressure. So you might find that there's a perfect coach out for you, out there for you who, who wants to work with and, you. And actually by doing that, by just gradually building up, almost when you do finally maybe plan to do an event, you're always just putting that cherry on the top and just re you're really ready. You've got the foundations there to start putting the interval training on or whatever you need to do. Um, in terms of your questions around a coach, um, you're right, if you search online for pre-made plans, they're mostly going to be orientated around an event, a six week, eight week training plan towards a sprint triathlon, etc. Your best bet is either join a local club um, where you can just simply join in with sessions or you may find that they actually give you a bit of a plan, a training plan for the week that you can come and join in with sessions or go find yourself a bespoke one to one coach that is going to tailor training towards your needs. Yep. Good luck with that. Uh, next question and that's from Gerardo Chaparro. How bad is it to have a wrong frame size? In my case, according to my measurements, 185 centimeters height and a 90 centimeter leg, I should have a 60 centimeter frame. However, I only, the only frame available was a 58 and I didn't want to wait six plus months uh, or who knows how many months, good, yeah, right. at this point. Yeah, to get a bike and then I, then I just thought I'd adjust the saddle height. Thanks in advance for the advice. I hope it's not that bad, he says with a little emoji uh, crossing the fingers. Well. It's not that bad. Firstly, Mark is six foot one, six yeah, foot six two, one. and I am six foot, and we both ride either 56 or 58 road bikes. So I don't think you really need a 60 centimeter. You are probably at the upper limit of the 56 to 58, but uh, you'll be okay on a 58 centimeter frame. So don't stress too much. The thing with frame sizes is it's not, you can adjust the saddle height, as you said, uh, you can lower your saddle for a bigger frame or raise your saddle for a smaller frame, but it's not just the, the saddle height that changes with frame size. What also changes is the top tube length. Uh, so you will have a different reach uh, how far your handlebars are away from you depending on your frame size. And that's obviously what you want to get right. You want that whole triangle of your reach and your drop and your, and your uh, saddle seat post to be the right size for you. And you can compensate for that. You can put a longer stem on if your bike is too short for you. Uh, you can raise the saddle if your bike is too low for you. Uh, but you do want to be on roughly the right size frame before you start. You don't want to be tweaking too much and putting a 120 millimeter stem on so that you can fit the bike. Yeah, because ultimately you, you are probably going to end up affecting the feel of the bike, perhaps even your power output. And let's face it, you may end up spending more money on changing crank lengths and all sorts when you should have, you could have just bought yourself a different bike, a different yeah. size. Um, that said, some people do prefer going on the smaller end or the larger end. So you've got to work with what, you know, what is suitable, what you prefer. Uh, next question from Phil Gibbs. Um, I have my first triathlon booked for June. Um, thanks to us guys for helping and towards that. Awesome. Please, we can help. Um, but as I don't have a triathlon specific uh, cycling shoe, I'm thinking of putting on my cleated shoes in T1 before a flying cycle cross mount rather than having them attached to the pedals. Any issues with this method? No, not at all. And in fact, you'll probably find that a large proportion of people at an event, a travel event, are actually doing exactly the same as you, if not slower. They're what most people you'll find are doing is coming out of transition, going over that mount line, and stopping and mounting the bike. You're talking about doing a cyclocross mount, so yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, fly mount. I actually did this uh, recently. We did a 
sprint relay and I didn't have any triathlon shoes. I wasn't comfortable slipping my feet into boas on the bike. So I did exactly what you're talking about. I put my shoes on in T1, ran to the mountain line and then mounted the bike with my shoes already on. Uh, there's absolutely no shame in doing this. In fact, you'll probably go faster than many of these people who do their flying mount with the shoes already clipped onto their bike uh, and then to get it wrong, either losing the shoe or can't get their foot in or whatever else. Nothing can go wrong if you just put your own shoes on and run out. So it is the safest option. And unless you're really good at a flying mount and getting your feet into the shoes, it's often the fastest option too. Yeah. So no shame. Particularly absolutely. for your first triathlon, just get the basics right and have a fun day. And then if you want to build from there, go check out some of our transition videos on the yeah, channel. Yeah, there you go. Uh, one more question, and that's from Jobanski. Hashtag Coach's Corner. Hey guys, this year I've set a goal of running sub 25 minute so 20 minute 5k whoa that's a big goal which means a pb improvement of more than five minutes whoa ambitious my question is this should i base my training off that pace and rely on each race to get closer to that pace uh, and my goal or do i base my training more on a conservative safe route to meet smaller goals along the way that will eventually lead to a sub 20 um or does it really matter since this is such a short distance? Thanks again for the advice. I think this is a really interesting question because a lot of people do this. They go, I really, they, they get in time in their mind. They're like, right, I'm training towards a sub 130 half marathon. And they do all their training, but it's a substantial you know, shaving of their PB. Um, yeah. And in this case, he's literally knocking a minute per kilometer off his current PB. I mean, that's, that's big. That's very ambitious, actually. And yeah, you can do that. And if you're up for it and you can do those shorter sessions and shorter intervals at that, he's talking about going from five minute per K pace to four minute per K pace. If you can do them comfortably at four minutes per K pace or even faster, then yeah, it's probably a realistic goal. But if four minutes per K pace is so out of your reach right now for even a short interval of say 500 meters or one kilometer, uh, you're too ambitious. Uh, you need to work towards this. This is a long-term goal. And we would definitely suggest that what you do, especially with something as short as a 5K, because what you can do is races fairly regularly. You know, if you're doing a marathon and you want to aim for one big attempt at a PB, uh, we can understand you going for an ambitious goal because putting six months of work in for one attempt only to knock five minutes off when you could maybe have knocked 10 minutes off is a lot of work for a small gain. Whereas with a 5K, you can do small gains every month until you get to that sub 20K, sub 20 minutes. We don't think you should go straight in for the sub 20 minutes no. immediately, uh, knocking five minutes off your PB. Uh, try knock one minute off your PB and then another minute and then another minute the next month, etc. until you get there. Uh, yeah little bits at a time. Yeah. The other risk, of course, when you go in from such a big change in your pace from what you obviously have done before is injury. Uh, you're obviously going to put your body under a lot of strain going for these much faster paces than you've ever run before uh, and injury becomes more and more of a factor and more and more of a risk and it's just not worth the risk. Yeah, the other thing to consider just in addition to those faster intervals is just being a little bit more specific with some threshold pace work as well in addition to your easy runs of course. Um, of course going back to our first question we're answering how to do a threshold run test and finding out your threshold pace so then you can essentially rack up some good time at or below threshold pace and that's ultimately going to bump your threshold up and and that is kind of the crux and helps us towards endurance events and how long we can push hard for. <laughs> yeah. I said last question. Do we have time for one more? Oh, I think that's quite a lot. Should we save that one for next oh, we'll week? we'll save that for yeah. next week. Tune in next week for another question and a whole bunch more questions, which you can leave in the comment section down below if you use the hashtag GTN Coaches Corner. And we'll be answering your questions next week. Thanks for watching. Remember to give this video a like and subscribe to GTN for more triathlon content.